The following presentation was recorded by VIEW Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. All right, so first of all, thank you all, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, so he pretty much uh, gave my background. My name is Russell Bryant. I work on Asterisk, and I work for Digium, who is the corporate sponsor of the Asterisk project. And uh, for those of you that uh, just heard Mark Spencer's presentation, um, you know, I so I work for him, and I work for his company, and I'm one of the guys that he brought in to help uh, push the company further along and, and further uh, the Asterisk project. And on a quick note, thank you. What is this? <laughs> Disconnect, man. It won't go. My mouse won't go over it. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, now I have to take this off. Well, anyways, I'll try to talk while I try to fix this. But um, so I, I, this is really great that it's in Clemson because I went to Clemson University for my undergraduate degree in, in computer engineering. I just graduated in December of 2006, and this is the first time I've. Uh, been back. Go away. There it goes. Okay. So this is the first time I've been back since I graduated, so it's, it's really fun to be here. Plug back in. And, for, and so when I was at Clemson, this is where I got into open source. I mean, um, this is where I, and some of the people here that helped me learn a lot about Linux are here as well, so that's pretty exciting. And we're back. Okay. So like I said, I, I graduated from Clemson in the fall of 2006. I've been working on Asterisk since 2004. That was about the middle of my college career. And uh, I got employed by the corporate sponsor pretty shortly after. Um, so uh, an overview of what I want to talk about today. So first of all, I want to talk about what is Asterisk. Because while that seems like a really simple question, um, the answer is not always so straightforward. And so I do want to clarify at least what I think Asterisk is. And I'm curious what you think it is as well. Um, I have a number of features that I want to talk about. Just I have a random sampling of, of cool stuff that Asterisk can do, and so uh, and hopefully, so whether you're new to Asterisk or whether you have a lot of experience with it, I hope I can cover something that that you didn't already know that's interesting. And I want and have a few comments about the future. You know, what, where are we going from here? And then I, I will have some time for questions and answers at the end. So what is Asterisk? And for, to start that, I'll ask you guys. So someone throw out an answer. What is it? It's a PBX. A toolkit, okay. Platform. All right. So, yeah, a PBX, that type of answer is what is, is probably the most common type of answer that you get. Now, maybe it's a PBX. Maybe to some people it's for it's a conferencing server. Maybe you run call conferencing with it. Maybe it's your voicemail platform. Maybe you have an existing phone system, but you just use asterisk for, for voicemail. Uh, maybe you have, a, you, know, you have a tech support department and you use it for... Uh, for your call center platform, or maybe you just you have a business and you need a, a, an IVR, a voice menu, so let people call in and check on the status of an order or something like that. But the real, the, the good answer that I was looking for, and a couple of people said it, is um, it's it's a platform, and, and I really want to make that clear. It's an, or the I guess official term, it's an open source telephony applications platform. So it's not a PBX, and so I'm not the marketing guy. I mean, the marketing guy would probably be telling you, oh yeah, it's a PBX. Yeah, well. It's not okay. It's a. It's 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 like. Uh, it's, I think comparing it to Apache is pretty. It's pretty good. I mean, it's it's a. It's a it's a tool to build your application, and so that as, that's what Asterisk provides. Is it's it's for building telephony applications, and whether you want to turn it into a PBX or you want to turn it into letting your plants call you when they need water or some other random thing. I mean, you can do that. We provide all the things we have. Big features built in, like voicemail, I mean, that's easy to turn on. It's like a line, the configuration file. It's like, I would like voicemail. So we have that type of stuff built in. But we also have lots of developer interfaces that make it easy to build voice applications. So I want to play this sound file. I want to listen for digits. I want to do these types of things. So we have lower level things that you can write to as well. So, all right, from there, I want to talk about some random cool features. Like I said, it's a toolkit, and we've got lots of... Uh, infrastructure in place for building your telephony applications. And so I'm going to go over some of the, those cool things. And, while, and on this note, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'd love to, uh, to, to answer any questions you may have. Um, so that. All right, one of the cool things uh, that we have is IMAP storage for voicemail. Now, this is not necessarily a new feature. We've actually had it a couple years now. But uh, it's something I do like to mention because it's pretty neat. 
Um, so if you, you have existing IT infrastructure in your business, you can reuse your existing IMAP infrastructure for voicemail. So you set up Asterisk as your phone system, and, and you say, uh, you know, when someone leaves you a voicemail, go store it in this IMAP account. So pe all, your, all your users just use their same email client, and then yeah, they have a special folder for voicemail, and your voicemail show up there. And the biggest benefit of IMAP storage for voicemail is that as opposed to, like, voicemail to email is something we've had for forever, and other systems have it too. And that's nice, but what this does is it's, it's, it's more native. So while the phone on your desk will say you have new messages or this many new and this many old and whatever, as you make changes in your email client, it also gets reflected on your phone. So there's some native integration there that makes it really nice. And, uh, and so one of the biggest, on this... Uh, talk about this feature, one of the big buzzwords in telecom right now is unified communications. And so this is sort of part of that. It's about, you know, in your business you have all these all the different communication infrastructure. You have your email, you have your telephones, you have maybe you have Jabber or maybe you have whatever. And so we're starting to look at all these new ways to tie all these things together and have better integration between them. And this is one of the things that we have for that. Um, and, and also on the unified communications uh, note, we have some native Jabber or XMPP integration, which is uh, really excellent stuff. Um, the first thing I have listed here is Jingle or Google Talk. So we have native uh, interoperability with Google Talk. So you can, you can make your, your phone system can make calls out to the Google, Google, Google Talk network, or it can receive calls from that network, um, and also uh, using the, the XMPP standard Jingle, which is a little bit different than Google Talk, but very close to the same thing. We have uh, native interoperability with that. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so another thing you can do with this, uh, you can have asterisk send messages. So call routing and, and handling calls is a very scriptable and very con you know, controllable interface. So as a, one of the things you can do when you're handling calls is you can have it send messages. And, and while this is it's actually a pretty simple feature, people do lots of really cool things for it. So for example, your sales guy, um, a call comes in, and you want to send him a message and that has like all the information about the caller. This is his, here's a, a link to his account, or here's uh, just lots, you know, whatever you want to have pop up on, on someone's screen when they get a phone call. You can have, you know, you can use Jabber for that, send him a message. Oh, you can receive messages. That's actually a pretty new thing we can do now. So, so that same example, say your tech support guy uh, gets a, a call coming in, and he gets a Jabber message sort of offering him a call. Um, maybe for some reason he doesn't want to take it. I don't know. You could send messages back to Asterisk to affect call handling. Maybe you want to redirect them to someone else or something before you even answer the call. And so you could uh, act on that. Um, presence monitoring is another thing. So you can do call routing based on your Jabber presence. So if everyone in your business uh, is using Jabber because you use that as a way to communicate and you set yourself away, you can have your phone system automatically route calls based on that information. So... Oh, you know, uh, Jeff said he was, he's uh, away right now, so I'm going to go ahead and send his call automatically to voicemail or whatever it is that you want to do based on that information. And additionally with presence, you, um, some of the nicer, like, new phones that you can get have, like, sp uh, you can monitor people's state on the phone itself. So you can have a little button that's like a speed dial for your boss or something and, and it has a little LED next to it. Uh, so you can have Jabber presence uh, reflect that state that shows up on the phone as well. So someone says their Jabber client is away, and now your phone reflects that, that person is busy, so you shouldn't call them. So all that stuff is built in. Jabber is like a voice software, voice Um Well, no, Jabber uh, itself is a it's it's an IT, IETF standard for instant messaging. That's probably the basic, but there's lots of extensions for it, including the Jingle uh, and Google Talk stuff for adding voice to it. But there's, there's lots of stuff, but um, it's, the short answer is it's an IM protocol. Um, native calendar integration. This is something brand new as well that, uh, that one of our um, employees that, that works with me uh, did in his free time. He... He had some meetings. Well, he had trouble. He had trouble making it to meetings. He's a you know, he's a developer. He gets into code, and he always forgets meetings, misses conference calls, and so forth. So he said, "You know what? It would be great if Asterisk called me when I had a meeting." And so then he went off, and he added um, native calendar integration to Asterisk. So, and he did. I mean, he went all out. It, it supports Exchange, iCal, and CalDAV um, right now, and you can do all kinds of really cool stuff. So again, with call with call routing, when you get to 
control what happens to calls when they come in. You can check calendar status based on that. I see, uh, I see that Russell's in a meeting right now, so I'm not going to uh, send him a call because I know he's not there. Or, for example, uh, you know, Russell's calendar says he's out today, so I'm going to automatically send his call to his cell phone without even messing around trying to ring his desk phone, things like that. And, and the same comments I said about presence information with, uh, with Jabber, you can do with a calendar as well. Uh, you could have uh, a phone reflect that someone is busy based on their calendar. You can have, um, you could, and uh, yeah, presence stuff, it's cool. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and the biggest thing, like I said, what he wanted to do with it was automatically generate calls. So you could have a calendar as a source of data, and you could and set uh, Astorisk up to, say, um, to read events and then make calls out to the attendees for a meeting, for example, um, and which is really nice for conference calls, especially people that, like you know, engineers who don't spend most of our days in meetings where we're doing development, but occasionally we have a conference call here or there, and we need to make sure we don't forget it. Well, we just have the system automatically call us at the right time, and that makes it easy. So that's something that just went in, I think, last week or something, but he had been working on it for a little while. So I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, that was the wrong direction. Um, call event logging. So this is a new feature that, uh, this is also brand new. So it, in Asterisk, for years, we've had something called CDRs, which are call detail records. And the way that was designed was you have a call, and there's a single record that records what happened in that call. But as Asterisk has evolved into a very complex toolkit, a, a single record is far from sufficient to reflect what happens in a phone call. So what we have now in this new system is it's not there's not a single record for a call. It's... it's it's a, uh, it just, there's a log of everything that happened, all of the different decision points that happened for a phone call. And this is uh, really nice for, well, debugging, but also for building really nice interfaces. So if someone wants to go in and look at call logs, not only do they see that a phone call came in, but this is an example of one of the Digium uh, GUIs. It's a, a call came in. This is the number it came in on. It rang the menu. It rang this person. Uh, that person answered and talked to him for 44 seconds. That person made a transfer to this other person, and then it got hung up. And, and so now we have logs that log everything that happened, uh, which is really exciting, especially for building nice interfaces that have uh, really good logs. Uh, another cool thing, this is also new, is we have what's called uh, connected and redirecting party information support. And essentially what this is is, so if you get a phone call, your phone has caller ID on it, so you see who's calling you. And that's a start, right? That's the beginning of your call. But as I sort of mentioned a second ago, calls are more complicated than that. It's not I call you and that's the end of the story. It's I call you and then we start transferring each other around and then maybe you go to a conference bridge and then maybe you get sent to voicemail. and then So you, you, the call is a lot more complicated. And that name and number that came in at the very beginning, well, that's not, that's not the truth for the entire call. So we need to be able to control what the phone says on the display to say who you're talking to. And that was actually a lot of work to up, uh, update that infrastructure. Um, but it's, it's more than just, there's, there's some built-in stuff so that as you get transferred around, the phone's getting updated. But what's, what's really awesome, I think, is that there's really easy interfaces for you as the telephony application developer to control what's on the phone. So if you're building uh, a script for routing a call or handling it, you can control it. So say if you built... Um, I don't know, say a custom menu. You could start updating the display to say what menu you're at or something. You could really abuse it in interesting ways. So now you have really easy ways to control uh, the name and number fields on the display on the phone to make it short. And that's cool. Um, new bridging infrastructure. And so now we're getting a little bit lower level. But one of the things that recently got done was ripping out how calls come in and they, bridging calls together is essentially so, you know, my phone, your phone, his phone, whatever, and now we're all talking to each other, so that's a bridge. Um, the only way that we had previously for doing bridging of more than two people together was using a kernel interface that we also distribute, but that was specific to Linux, and uh, it's a little bit additional install burden, uh, but now we have new infrastructure that uses you know, newer interfaces and such, and it's all in user space, and, and we don't require the kernel interface for conferencing anymore. And um, if you're a C programmer, it's a, it's a really easy API to use to start, and so if you wanted to write um, sort of low-level applications in C to, or interacting with channels and bridging them together and stuff, um, it, it's a really nice interface where we didn't actually have one before. So essentially no more 
Uh, correct. That 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 is that's exactly right. So and um, and it's 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 more than just uh, asterisk one six two. So um, and it's more than just a ZT dummy, right? So it's it's Zaptel or Dottie as it's named now. Um, we we use that kernel interface for all of the mixing. I mean, it was more than just timing. It was the conference mixing itself. We had we sent all of the audio down in the kernel and got all mixed and sent back to us. So I mean, all of the hard conferencing stuff was down in the kernel, and we've uh, rewritten it, and it's a completely new interface. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, the people that don't use Linux are really happy, but we won't talk about them because this is Linux Fest. Um, Okay, a distributed event system. Uh, this is something that I've kind of worked on uh, off and on for a while. Um, one of the challenges of Asterisk, uh, and if, if you look at some of the history of how Asterisk was developed, it was very much a one system thing. It's, it's a monolithic application on one box. I mean, Mark wrote it because he needed a phone system for his business, so it, wrote, it was an application that ran on one box. But Asterisk is being pushed into bigger and bigger environments. I mean large enterprises, I mean, places that are handling many thousands of calls at, the time, at a time. And so one box doesn't quite cut it anymore. You need, so we're getting into clustering and things like that. And so now, how do, so we're looking at different ways to have asterisk servers talk to each other and share information so they can work together on things. And so uh, what I have, what I've written is a uh, it's generic infrastructure for, for distributed events. It's asterisk servers being able to tell each other that stuff has happened and then being able to act on them. And probably the most useful thing that you can do today based on that system is sharing device state. So uh, when I pick up my phone and make a phone call, the, the server that's handling that knows that I'm on a phone call, but the other eight servers in the cluster, for example, don't. But they need to know because, um, say, for if your phone is on a different one and your phone has a little light that tells you if I'm busy or not, that server needs to know that I'm busy so it can make your light turn on. So it's like a whole lot of work to make lights turn on, right? But, um, and it, but that's the, it's what we have to do to get these servers to work together and know the information. So that's what happens now, is you can have a cluster of servers sitting in a rack, and calls can hit any of them, and all of the servers now know about those, uh, those state changes and can and do all the things that they normally did um, based on the information, even though it's not in the same box. And that same uh, system can be used for voicemail as well. It's another example. Is just maybe you have only one server that's handling your voicemail, but you have another dozen that's handling that are handling calls that are not voicemail, for example. You want the light that turns on when your message waiting uh, when messages are available to turn on, even though the voicemail isn't on the same box as your call. And so that's part of it. So the voicemail server knows the state of your mailbox, and it informs the rest of the cluster about that state. Um, again, lots of work to make a light turn on. Or change the dial tone if you're using an analog phone. That's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's about managing expectations. People have that people expect their phone to tell them when they have a voicemail. They don't care how complicated the server infrastructure is. Dang it, that light better turn on. So, and so uh, we do what we can to make that happen. Uh, yes, it works regardless of the voicemail storage. Sure does. Um, all right. I want to talk about voice over IP security for a minute. Um, some of the things that you do to protect yourself in general with voice over IP security are kind of common sense. But for some reason, and I don't know if maybe just people are used to telecom being on a different network than the Internet, and so they don't take security as seriously. I'm not sure. But, um, but but there's a lot, voice over IP attacks are becoming increasingly common. And the most common is brute force attacks. It's people scanning for uh, servers offering voice over IP services and then trying to make calls out through them. So that, and then people are getting hit with like $10,000 bills because you know, someone started making calls to their server. So this is yeah, a huge hit to your, uh, to your budget if you, if you aren't careful. And the things you do to protect yourself against you know, almost all of this stuff, it's pretty easy. So... General networking stuff, and I'm not going to talk about firewalling too much. That's another, I'm not an expert there. But, I mean, don't accept calls. Be careful from accepting calls from the world. If you don't have to accept calls from anywhere on the Internet, then don't. Excuse me. Um, but if you do, then employ uh, good security practices. For example, using strong passwords. I would say the number one problem uh, with people that are getting hit with these big bills because people are making phone calls is they have their system open to the Internet, 
they, and their username and passwords are, are simply numeric. So my phone is, is extension 6098 at my work. And so people set up systems like that where the username for the phone is 6098 and the password is 6098. Okay, so what do people do? They go and they just do a brute force thing where they're just scanning for valid usernames going just numerically, and then they scan, and they try to brute force the password using uh, numbers. And so people break in really fast using that. So don't use numbers. That's it's stupid. Um, <laughs> I mean, for, at least for the password, goodness. So, yeah. Uh, call limits. Um, how, my phone doesn't need to be able to make 200 calls at the same time. I mean, that's kind of... So, but by default, you know, accounts... There's no limiting on it, and you have as many as you want. And sometimes you do need that many calls if it's, a, if it's connections between two boxes together, for example. But if it's a phone, then put some combo limits in place. I mean, my phone doesn't need to do more than, like, three, for example, if I get really weird and have a couple people on hold. So use some call limits, and that sort of reduces the impact if you do get hit. Um, I have a link here to a blog post that, that goes into more detail, various configuration options that you can do to make your system more secure as well. Um, and in, so on the uh, security topic, encryption as well. Uh, use encryption wherever possible. Um, the EECS2 voice over IP protocol, we've had encryption there since Asterisk 1.4. In Asterisk 1.6, there's encryption of uh, the signaling for SIP. And secure RTP is pretty much done. It's pending review and more testing. Uh, and if you use the interfaces for like writing third-party applications, the manager interface or the HTTP interface, of course, SSL is available as well, uh, there as well, so use it. And also on security, another project that I'm currently working on, and it's pretty much done, um, but it's not merged yet, is a, um, so it's a, it's a framework for having Asterisk report bad things that are happening um, so outside of the app to other tools. So, if, for example, if someone's trying to brute force your system, uh, you want to be able to know that's happening and automatically react, react on it, so block that IP address or whatever. And right now, some people are doing that with the existing log files, but the existing logs weren't really written with parsing in mind. I mean, they're human-readable logs, so it's kind of a messy solution. And so um, I, I talked about the event system a few minutes ago. Uh, this is uh, built on that same system. So when... Uh, Voice over IP services are noticing that there's lots and lots of failed authentication attempts. It's reporting these things, and then you can use that event system to uh, see that it's happening and have a tool that, that reacts on it. And there's going to be a log, well, there's a log file that's a part of this um, framework that, that's outputted in an easily parsable format, so you can write tools that um, block bad people. Um, and the coolest feature of all to me is that it's open source telephony. I mean, Asterisk and, and other open source telephony projects have, have turned the industry upside down, really. I mean, if you've, if you've ever been in telephony and, and looked at any of these systems, I mean, we're talking crazy amounts of money to buy this stuff. And now it's free software. And so it's really, uh, it's been a big thing. And beyond just the cost, also the flexibility of what you can do with it. And that's the best part. The future... Um, Reliability is is always been, I guess, my uh, number one priority and the priority that I put for the team of people that I that I work with at Digium. People have really high expectations about their dial tone, as it turns out. Um, you know, if Internet Explorer crashes, used to yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, duh. I mean, it's whatever. They're just used to it. But if they pick up the phone and they don't get dial tone or they try to make a call and it doesn't go out, I mean, that's like... You know, and that's the end of the world almost. And they're just people are used to getting their dial tone and being able to make phone calls. So that's a big deal for us, and, and we work really hard on making sure that our stuff is stable and we take those issues very seriously. Um, scalability, I, I mentioned that a few minutes ago as well. We have to be able to take it from one box to many, and uh, I mean you can do that today, but we need to make it easier. It needs to be part of the package. It needs to be stuff built in, and so that's the things that we're working on making the developer interfaces better and better. It's not a PBX, it's a toolkit, so we need to make it easy to use as a toolkit. Um, better APIs, more flexible, easier to use, and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing that's uh, taking off more and more, video and wideband audio. The, the audio quality on the traditional telephone network is, is set at, eight, um, uh, well, 
it's 8 kilohertz uh, sampling rate, but on the internet, you're not bound to that. You can have higher quality audio. So um, we have support for wideband today, and we're going to be adding more and more support for more codecs, better codecs, um, as, as the industry uh, moves in that direction, and video as well. And of course, it's an open source project. Um, I can, even though I'm at the you know, center of this stuff and I'm working on it every single day and talking to people that are working on it, stuff always shows up that I had no clue that people were working on. I mean, just huge, like people just show up and say, hey, I re rewrote this big subsystem or I added this huge new feature. And it, sh it just stuff shows up all the time and it's really fun. So who knows where we'll be in a year, two, three, five. Um, but that's part of the fun. And that is where I conclude. Um, and so from now, I have I probably have plenty of time for questions. And so let's just talk about asterisk. Back there? Yeah. One second. Uh, you're talking about having support for codecs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question was, um, and I mentioned that we're working on additional codecs, and have I looked at Kelt? Um, I have, and I even I've met the guy that that wrote it, um, and uh, we definitely want to support it. I mean, it's you know planned. And in fact, I think he was working on adding support for it, you know, for fun as a project of his. So I guess I need to catch up with them and see how that's coming along. But certainly, it's a codec that we'd like to have support for. Yeah, uh, I think you had a question. Yeah. How's the man, how's the Skype uh, integration coming? I've seen some stuff about that. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how is the Skype integration coming along? So I mean. Back up second. Um, about, uh, I guess, I don't know, six months ago or whatever, we announced a project with Skype. And that, and the project is adding native support and asterisk for Skype. So it's allowing people to call a Skype username, and that you know, makes a phone call into your asterisk system, and the other way around as well. So you make a call from whatever phone you have uh, through asterisk, and those calls can go out to the Skype network to any Skype username. The project is coming along very well. In fact, it works. Um, and I th and uh, it's been in beta for months. The thing that's holding it up is actually most mostly on the Skype side, to be honest. Um, there's just some there's some infrastructure that they're finishing up to get in place um, so that we can launch the product. But it, it works great, and, and we're we're using it on our system. You can call the Skype user uh, Digium calls our PBX, and uh, what it's working. Beyond 1.6 or beyond um, 1.4? So to repeat the question, it was what version of Asterisk will that be supported in? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think we're going to even have support for it for Asterisk 1.4. I mean, as you might guess, it's not all open source due to Skype limitations. Um, so it's not going to be distributed as part of Asterisk. It'll be an add-on. But the add-on will be available, I'm pretty sure. Don't hold me to it. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's for Asterisk 1.4 and later. So pretty much anything that people would be using today, for the most part. Did you have a question? No? OK. Yeah? I've got a question for today. I'll break the ice. <laughs> Um, okay, so the question is about um, doing a registration of a voice over IP client to the server and uh, how secure is it? Um, if you use TLS with SIP, then it's very secure. Um, that's only supported in Asterisk 1.6 and almost nobody uses it and most clients don't support it either. Um, the authentication method that SIP uses is a MD5 challenge response mechanism. It's actually really easy to brute force. That's just the truth. But it's the, this isn't this is an asterisk, right? This is just SIP. This is the industry standard, by the way, the IETF standard. This is what everybody uses. Is a very um, easy to, to to break authentication method. So your best, don't let it go over unprotected networks if you want to be really safe. I mean, it's not plain text over the wire. I mean, if someone who doesn't really know what's going on downloads Wireshark, they're not going to see your password and then decode it. I mean, it's going to be a you know a hash, but Someone with a little bit more clue and who knows what MD5 is can break it pretty quickly. If you're pre 1.6, mm -hmm. what would you advise? Um, use a VPN okay. or something like that. So is 1.6 considered stable now? Yeah, it is. Uh, in fact, um, we just released asterisk 1.6.1. Uh, when, when was that? 
I don't know, a month ago or something. Um, and Asterisk 1.6.0 was released, I don't know, six months ago or something like that. So it's it's well in use in production at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Of course. I mean, always do your t always do your testing before you deploy a system, especially uh, something that people have such high expectations for as far as reliability goes. I always recommend a you know, a test setup and, and a good amount of testing for your environment because it is a toolkit. We can't. I mean, we do a lot of testing. We have a department dedicated to testing at Digium, and we and we do a lot. Like I said, we do a lot of testing, but it's a toolkit, and we can't test it in every way that that everyone's going to use it. So certainly test it for your environment and make sure that it does what you expect it to do. But beyond that, yes, I am comfortable saying it's recommended for, for production use. Any more questions about asterisk? As far as testing goes, yes. Uh, in my business, we do a little bit of Sure. Sure. Um, I guess there's a few different answers for that. So the question was, what about things that, for you know, a small business selling asterisk, uh, how do you test those things? Especially things that require special telco connections. I mean, you don't have, you know, a, a bunch of T1s coming into your office, for example. Sure. Yeah, so I guess, first of all, with BRI specifically, or any special telco connection, um, at least you, you do get additional support. You're not completely on your own from the vendor. So if you buy a Digium card, for example, we, we give free support for installation and configuration and, and setup and debugging and all that stuff. So the upfront stuff to make sure everything's working right, we do provide free support for all of that. Um, second of all, like I said with testing, I mean, for those types of things, I would recommend scheduling some on-site testing with the customer. Say, yeah, I'm going to put a phone system in for you, but we, before it goes live to your whole business, uh, I need whatever time you think, uh, some time to put it in at your location and do some lo testing there to make sure that it does what we think it does, whether that's after hours, over weekend, I mean, whatever works with your customer. And then beyond that, um, there are people, Digium and other companies, that provide that, I mean, we do asterisk all day, every day, and, and we provide, you know, uh, higher tier support. So we like we sell uh, support subscriptions, for example. So you have a subscription for a year. If something comes up, you get to call us and, and yell, us, yell at us about it. Yes? What's your view on running Asterisk at a virtual machine? I've been doing it, having some success, but mm -hmm. I was wondering how many other people would do it. Um, I mean, I don't ever, well, actually, I do, do, I do some development in virtual machines, but I hear a lot of people doing it in virtual machines and getting great success. And especially with the improvements we've made in Asterisk 1.6 for, um, um, separating the application more from kernel land so we're not requiring kernel interfaces for timing and that type of thing. And that's improving our support for virtualized environments even more. So lots of people do it uh, and are having great success. So that's about my only comment for it. Definitely a, a recommended thing. I have no reason to shy you away from it. Um, if anybody has, uh, well, before I, before I ask you that, um, if anybody has any additional questions for the rest of the day, feel free to come ask me. Also, up here uh, on your way out, there are some uh, asterisk water bottles and some asterisk T-shirts. Um, I asked the marketing uh, people for some stuff, and I got these T-shirts, but they appear to be all 2X. So <laughs> if you want to uh, sleep in it or... Or I mean, if you have, I mean, whatever. I'm just saying, like, I don't have an assortment, really. I just have um, two X. So um, feel free to have them. I don't really want to take them, take them back. So, okay, you had a question. Yeah, um, there are a lot of integrated T's sold up where where I'm working, mm -hmm. and I know that y'all support static integrated T's, I believe, with the dynamic allocation where every time I make a call. Bandwidth drops and the number of calls can go up. Do y'all support that directly? Um, okay, so the, the question is, do we support dynamic uh, integrated. integrated T1s? So where the voice fraction integrated. of the T1 is, is voice and data and, and the fraction between them changes. Um, not really. I know you do static. Yeah, static. I mean, if it's static, so if you Are know half your... To? Um, to be honest, it's not something we've talked about very much. Now, I, I am... 
we have like a whole half of engineering that's in charge of the hardware stuff and all and and the drivers and the interfaces and and all the stuff related to the use of the hardware, which is the other guys. So I'd have to ask them uh, if that's something they've been talking about. But there are a lot of those being sold. Okay. And it would be nice to be able to just get sure. that straight into the card, the yeah. card, and handle it all. But right. Yeah. So yeah, it's not something we have a spec um, support for. As far as what to do about it, uh, I would recommend. I mean, call our sales guys and, and yell at them. Not yell, but. You know, express your concern because that's how stuff gets done. Is if customers are saying, "Hey, this is a problem for me, and this is a feature that we could really use in my area or whatever," then they hear that, and and that goes into our list of priorities of what we're going to go do, and and then it'll get done. So that's about the it's probably the best avenue. Question back there against the wall. Would you mind sharing some of your opinion on like uh, small businesses purchasing a hosted PBS? Um, what's my opinion on small business off-site phone systems? Um, I mean, it's it's good. I think I think a lot of people try to do that with a cheap internet connection that, um, and then they're expecting telco or liability, and then when they can't make phone calls or the audio is bad because you know someone started a BitTorrent in the in the computer in the back office and whatever, <laughs> then. You know they kind of get what they asked for, so uh, it's with some with intelligent network design. I think it's a great solution. It's a short answer. And obviously, tons of people have made businesses doing exactly that with Asterisk and building their own custom interface on top of it. And it's a pretty big business. All right. Well, I guess that's everything. Thanks a lot, guys. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.